the Clayman Institute for Gender Research at Stanford University. Reinvigorating gender equality in the 21st century. The timing of my appointment to the center in 1990 um, was a very, um, let's say, time timely one in the sense that it was just about then that the entire country was becoming aware of the deficits in our knowledge about women's health. And that's really largely owing to the work of the Congressional Women's Caucus, uh, specifically um, Pat Schroeder, Democrat from Colorado, and Olympia Snow, Republican, from Maine, who together had focused on the fact that in all of the time that um, the, uh, the, uh, the NIH had been in, uh, in operation, only 11% of the budget of the NIH went to study anything that had to do with women's health, however defined. And the two of them and their colleagues in the caucus went about to um, finally to um, develop and get passed something called the Women's Health Equity Act, H.R. 3075. And that was a very far-reaching act which uh, set down rules, for example, and this is just one very small example. Prior to that legislation, uh, there were no guidelines or rules about women getting mammograms, for example, <laughs> nor was there any uh, system of oversight for providers of mammograms. And they looked at every aspect of women's health and really began to uh, develop legislation. Because of their increasing awareness about the need for more information about women's health, uh, finally there was the um, Office of Women's Health of the National Institute of Health, uh, of the CDC, of the FDA. Uh, so there were these centers of interest and awareness uh, throughout our government. But the, at the time, uh, the, the concept of women's health was still quite narrow. And as Lynn indicated, uh, women's health issues were largely defined by their reproductive role. So that uh, while people knew uh, the importance of breast cancer and uterine cancer and cervical cancer uh, in causing death and um, disability in women. The idea that there were more deaths among women at that time from heart disease, from lung cancer, was something that wasn't even on the radar screen. And what w began to happen after all of this legislation was passed and these um, in, uh, organizations were now um, populated by people with interest in in women's health was that there was, began to be a lot of pushback. And I began to hear among my colleagues, well, you know, women live seven years longer than men. What's, you know, why don't we do something to improve the health of men? And that was really a, a prevailing attitude. What nobody recognized at that point was that those extra seven golden years that women enjoy on average were in general um, spent in a state of uh, disability and uh, dependency and often in poverty. So out of that recognition, people began redefining life expectancy. And instead of looking at absolute life expectancy, now we've introduced the concept um, of active life expectancy, expectancy, so introducing a qualitative aspect to it. And I think that has been very helpful in recognizing that once you did that, there really was no uh, advantage among women over men. So the, 
the reason I think we began thinking about why we knew so little about women's health at that point, here we are in the richest country in the world, uh, so many millions, billions of dollars being spent on health research, why did we know so little about women? Uh, and it was only 23 years ago that we're talking about. Well, it, it ha it's an interesting history because if you think about how our knowledge about health comes about, or did come about, um, back in the early days, I would say before uh, the 70s, most of the research that was done on health issues was done on medical students. And who were the medical students? They were men. 90% of medical students in those days were men. So. Uh, and I should say most of them were not volunteers in the true sense, but, uh, <laughs> but they were somehow coerced into being subjects before uh, stringent laws came into effect. But in any case, that was the database. And if you look beyond that, yes, there was research being done uh, on drugs by pharmaceutical companies, that was always the case. But there again, uh, you may or may not know that women were specifically excluded from participation <laughs> in drug research because well, first of all, there are hormonal fluctuations in the course of their uh, days, and that might have an adverse effect on uh, drug metabolism. Therefore, don't put them in the studies. I'll get back to that one in a minute. But the other reason they were often excluded uh, was that, well, they may be pregnant, and if we expose them to a drug, it may have an adverse effect on their fetus. The thought that they might ask women and uh, have them make the decision as to whether they should or could be subjects in a research study, believe it or not, was not really considered. So um, the, the database on which we've done all of this planning and all that we knew about women's health was really derivative and very little of it was specifically derived from women themselves. But now that we've had uh, more awareness, I talked about the work of the Congressional Women's Caucus. I'll also say that uh, the, um, I mentioned that the Office of Women's Health was established in the FDA and it, they mandated that women be included in drug studies, uh, which is surely a step in the right direction. Uh, there was the, uh, a number of longitudinal studies were launched to focus specifically on the health issues of women and of course the Women's Health Initiative, which Marcia has been the PI for, and is one of the most important. There was also the Longitudinal Nurses Study that's recently been expanded. And believe it or not, uh, the Department of Defense made a major effort in terms of research on breast cancer. Uh, so there were a lot of good things going on. The Society for Women's Health research was developed. There are journals on women's health. Um, and there's a lot now that we have to go on, and a lot of progress has been made. But before we start celebrating, let me just mention that we still have a ways to go. Specifically, as you may know, the women's um, congressional caucus was disbanded in 1994 after the Newt Gingrich sweep. Uh, that's gone. The Office of Women's Health of the NIH, which was a, at the time a great hope to us all, was given a budget of $2 million a year for the first year. If you have any idea what the cost of the other 27 institutes of the National Institute of Health get, it's in the um, billions at this point. Uh, the reason, the alleged reason for doing that was kind of interesting. They decided that they didn't want to ghettoize women's health. They wanted women's health to take place in all of the 27 institutes of health. So by not funding that particular office, they um, expected that this would happen. And needless to say, it is not. The, um, 
I mentioned that now women must be included in drug studies, and that's definitely a step in the right direction. However, there is no uh, requirement that sufficient numbers of women be included in these drug studies so that you can have uh, a statistically significant finding. So you just have to throw, <coughs> throw some women in, and then you're in compliance if you're a drug company. The fact that we now know from other studies that hormones, uh, particularly estrogen and progesterone, have a very profound effect on both the absorption of drugs, um, the metabolism of drugs, the excretion of drugs, and um, failure to take that into consideration in the selection of uh, subjects in these drug studies is really um, um, I would say malpractice if we're talking about um, health care, but to say that it, we're missing an, a very important opportunity to learn um, about how drugs and their effects are different in women at different stages of the menstrual cycle, at different pubertal stages, women pre- and post-menopausal. And this isn't just an intellectual uh, interest. It, if you think about uh, the impact of not having the necessary information as a physician, uh, the, nece the information you need in order to properly prescribe a drug, uh, and recognizing that if, and there are now a few very small studies, self-funded studies, that show that for some drugs, uh, if you give the standard dose that was designed uh, on the basis of studies on men, if you give that standard dose uh, to a menstruating woman, you'll find that at one half of the menstrual cycle, the level of that drug in her bloodstream is too low to have any effect. And at the other uh, half of the menstrual cycle, the level is so high as to be toxic. It's not to say that that's true for all drugs, but it truly is for a number of them. And we have no idea. And we know that women are prescribed many more drugs than are men, and we're, we're doing that as physicians without any information, and that's really quite, quite upsetting. The, um, I don't know how many of you saw, but just last week there was a report of a 400% increase in drug overdo uh, overdose deaths among women in the last year. And this has, uh, I think the implication was that this is um, intentional or suicidal, but knowing what we know about uh, the absence of appropriate data on drug metabolism in women, it worries me uh, that some of that could very well have been um, the women taking their drugs as prescribed, but without really knowing what their needs and capabilities were for metabolizing the, uh, the drugs. There are so many other examples. We obviously don't have time, but there surely still are gender differences in the um, access and distribution of um, limited resources like uh, organs for transplantation, and even in the diagnosis of heart disease, there are still gender differences in that. And as we go on, we still know very little about health issues for ethnic minority women, um, and surely for sexual minority people. And we, on the other side of the ledger, know very little about so-called women's diseases like osteoporosis or eating disorders in men, and they are really important issues, and we need to know more about them. So as we go forward, uh, besides trying to fill the data gap and all, all the information that we still need, uh, I think we also have to remember the importance of trying to understand the precursors and the risk factors for some diseases that are to be found in childhood and even before that, and focus on how to prevent some of the many uh, illnesses that we have to deal with and that are costing so much for society. And of course, 
as I learned early on at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, we really have to know more about how to change behavior of patients and physicians in order to improve the health of all of our people. So thank you so much.